Modern-day Egypt lives side by side with remnants from the times of the pharaohs. Giant statues. The pyramids that adorn the left bank of the Nile, where the sun sets. The magnificent temples such as those in Karnak and Luxor, built by the hard labor of hundreds of thousands of workers, still stand. But what is left is only a fraction of what the giant cities must have been. So why, in spite of the skill of these ancient builders, has so little of these ancient cities survived until today? The answer lies in the importance attributed to the buildings. While temples and pyramids were destined to withstand the onslaught of centuries, ordinary people under the pharaohs had to make do with crude mud bricks and straw dried in the sun, techniques that are still in use today. And yet, these were magnificent cities, such as Memphis, the pharaoh's first capital. We know about these cities because of the legacy of scribes, writers, at that time. This sculpture of a scribe from the Cairo Museum is an example of a man who could have lived his entire life in one of those crowded city streets at the time of the pharaohs. Scribes were highly respected figures in ancient Egypt, Years of study taught them to master the art of writing hieroglyphics, and they enjoyed privileges and honors reserved for upper classes. Writing was beyond the scope of the great majority of the population, and was thus shrouded in mystery. Scribes made up a unique profession. Many of them earned their living by writing out and copying public and administrative documents. The Nile River was the lifeline of ancient Egypt, and the home of most of the important cities. Memphis, just a few miles south of Cairo, was the first capital of the pharaohs. The road sign indicates the village of Mitrahina, announcing that we have arrived at the gates of the capital. It is difficult to imagine that such a desolate spot could have been the heart of one of the largest and richest cities in the ancient world. And yet, 4,000 years ago, there were majestic palaces and temples here, surrounded by an intricate maze of houses and streets. Memphis was home to some of the greatest minds of the era, brilliant scientists and refined sculptors, artists that created this alabaster sphinx, or this statue of Ramses II, one of the most impressive in all Egypt, buried under the sands for thousands of years. Nowadays, nothing remains of the ancient splendors of Memphis beyond this simple village, which is surrounded by the desert and a few date plantations. What became of this powerful metropolis, founded by King Menes in 3100 BC? This is what remains of the Temple of Ta, thought to have been one of the largest in ancient Egypt. Much of it is still buried under the small hill where the village of Mitrahina lies today. The problem is, when Memphis went into decline, its monuments were dismantled and the stones were used as building material for new construction. In the distance, you can see one of the many temples that adorned Memphis in a later period. And this is how the capital itself might have looked if you attempted to cross the bustling streets of the city center over 4,000 years ago. As scribes have indicated, bakeries were an important part of life at that time. If you needed bread in the morning, you would have gone to a bakery like this one, 
and bought a very special tasting bread. Bakers would remove the soft inside part of a loaf and sprinkle it with vinegar and water. Then the hollowed out loaf would be stuffed with a mixture made of pepper, honey, mint, coriander, cheese, salt and oil. The oven stood in the courtyard of the baker's workshop. Bartering was the sales method used as money wasn't introduced until 500 BC many years later. If you had to get some official papers signed, you would have to go to the residence of a high state official, who probably lived in a luxurious and prestigious house like this one. In the large dining room, he would probably have a display of exquisite vases, jars and furniture, a mark of the taste and status of their owner. The higher social classes loved to surround themselves with exquisite objects and wore elegant clothing complete with wigs and jewelry. Perfumes and cosmetics were also widely used by men. It was the custom to wear a cone of ointment on one's head, which melted in the heat of the day, saturating wigs and garments with perfume. In homes like this one, owners entertained their guests with sumptuous banquets. But what types of food and drink would be served at the table of a rich Egyptian? What was their diet? Since Egyptians aspired to reach the grand old age of 110, the recommended diet was varied and sensible. They ate three meals a day, a snack in the morning and another toward midday, and then the main meal, which corresponds to our dinner. There was no cutlery. Even the pharaoh and his family ate using their fingers, though it was considered good manners to use only the three fingers of the right hand. Then, as now, bread was produced in a number of different varieties, and it was kneaded by using hands or even feet. Despite the attention paid to their diets, the ancient Egyptians were found to have bad teeth. Archaeological studies of numerous mummies have proved this. But how could they have good diets and bad teeth? The answer, surprisingly enough, was due to the bread. Since it was produced with stone ground flour, it contained high quantities of sand. Not something you want to crunch on. If you had problems with your teeth, you would have to go to a dentist a profession that was in great demand at that time. The Egyptians loved their vegetables, garlic, onions, cucumbers, turnips, and lettuce. These were believed to make men amorous and women fertile. They also ate large amounts of seeds from chickpeas, broad beans, and lentils, which were exported all over the Mediterranean. Their favorite fruits were figs, pomegranates, and dates. Roast or grilled beef was considered a delicacy, though the preference was for birds such as geese, ducks, quail, pigeons, and even pelicans, which were also eaten by poorer people. On the other hand, it seems that chickens never appeared on the tables of the pharaohs and their subjects. Wine and strong beer were served at dinner. The wine was kept in sealed pitchers that had labels showing its name, origin, and vintage. These labels are some of the most curious written documents of the ancient world. The invention of writing took place around 3000 BC. As it spread, it allowed for organization of files and record keeping within the country for the first time. Early writing was derived mainly from the observation of nature called hieroglyphics. It was a writing system that aimed to represent ideas by means of drawings. The word scribe, for example, was composed of the hieroglyphic zesh. It portrayed a scribe's work utensils, a palette with slots for red and black pigment, a jar or a water sack, a reed pen or a tool for smoothing papyrus, all tied up together. Thanks to this writing system, and to the cursive version, Hieratic Script, we can understand the Egyptians' myths, fables, and scientific texts, along with their novels, travel journals, and adventure stories. The first adventure story in history is Egyptian, the story of Sinue, which was written more than 3,000 years ago. 
Egyptians had a strong sense of family, and women enjoyed a great deal of authority. The most common demonstration of affection was rubbing noses, while kissing was rare. Marriage was very important in ancient Egypt. The pharaoh could have more than one wife, and if he had the chance, lots of concubines. The man's goal was to give at least one child to each woman in his family. This is why Ramses II, one of the greatest Egyptian pharaohs, whose mummy is at the Cairo Museum, fathered more than 140 children. If you were looking for a lover and you couldn't find your way into their heart by regular means, you could resort to magic. Egyptians believed firmly in magic powers. There were magic cures for illnesses, formulas to ward off the evil eye, and love potions. Further down the Nile is Luxor, about 440 miles south of Cairo. Today it is a quiet place with boats skimming over the calm river waters and the narrow streets of the bazaar crossed by horse-drawn cabs popular with tourists. Luxor is the site of the ancient Egyptian city of Thebes, once the most powerful city in the world. Thebes was made capital instead of Memphis after its princes drove off the Hyksos people who had invaded Egypt around 1500 BC. Thebes, the city of a hundred gates. A city where only the grains of desert sand exceeded the riches that its half a million inhabitants had accumulated. Unlike Memphis, Thebes has not disappeared completely. Amongst the modern buildings, you can still see temples, avenues of sphinxes, and other imposing structures of its magnificent past. The remains of the temple dedicated to the god Amun bear witness to this. They were restored by archaeological studies at the end of the 19th century, with the demolition of hundreds of houses that had been built over them. Some of the excavations are still going on. A 15th century mosque still occupies part of the first courtyard. The temple lies parallel to the Nile. Its dimensions are truly majestic, over 800 feet long and 200 feet wide. On this occasion, the statue of Amun left its more permanent residence in the temple of Karnak and was moved on a sacred boat to visit this temple, its Ipit Reset, or Southern Harem. Two obelisks stood at the entrance to the temple. Now only one remains, but it is truly grand, over 80 feet high and weighing more than 230 tons. What happened to the second obelisk? Watching over the entrance are colossal statues of Ramses II, the pharaoh who was a fearless warrior. In the northwest corner of the temple's first courtyard is the mosque of Abu el Hagag, held in great esteem by Muslims. Among the columns here are statues of the pharaohs Amenhotep III and Ramses II. Here's what the entrance to the Temple of Amun would have looked like in ancient times. The facade was richly decorated with scenes from the epic battle fought by Ramses II against the Hittites in 1285 BC in Kadesh in modern-day Syria. We can see now how the two massive obelisks would have dominated the entrance. The mystery of what had happened to the second obelisk was solved in 1835 when King Mehmet Ali presented it to King Louis-Philippe of France. Less than two miles separate Luxor from Karnak, the site of the enormous complex dedicated to a trinity of gods, Amun, Montu, and Mut. Ten pylons, enormous surrounding walls, and hundreds of columns are laid out over a surface area that is more than 4,000 feet long and almost 2,000 feet wide, making this the largest temple ever built anywhere in the world. 
it took 2,000 years to build. And all of the pharaohs contributed something to the final layout. Once you enter the temple, you come to the biggest courtyard of all Egyptian temples, over 300 feet wide and 260 feet long. In the center of the courtyard, only one tall column survives of the ten that made up the cloister. These were built by Pharaoh Taharqa around 670 BC. This is where the sun boat was kept, which was used for the solemn processions from Karnak to Luxor. Let's see how the site would have looked in all its majesty. The cloister was composed of ten columns that were each over 60 feet high. Behind the columns, you can see the decorations of the second pylon, which was erected by Ramses II. In the center was a pedestal on which the sacred boat containing the statue of the god Amun was placed. The dimensions of this area are simply colossal. Beyond the second pylon, you enter one of the most imposing monuments we have inherited from Egyptian art. The huge hypostele, which was 330 feet wide and 174 feet deep with 134 columns. Enormous architraves raised the height of the ceiling to 75 feet. The 122 lateral columns with papyrus-shaped capitals are lower. This made it possible to put in windows that create amazing effects of light and shadow. The decorative scenes on the inside walls of the atrium, carved over 3,000 years ago, depict processions and coronation ceremonies. Here we can see Ramses II paying homage to the Theban divinities. The boat is taken in a procession by the priests of Amun, dressed up as mythological beings. The central axis of the temple leads to the most sacred part of the whole complex, the granite room that held the sacred boat. This is one of the two obelisks erected by Queen Hatshepsut. Almost 100 feet high, it is one of the tallest in all of ancient Egypt. Upon her death, her stepson, Pharaoh Tutmos III, who apparently detested her, had a wall built around the obelisk to obliterate the memory of the dead queen. The festival hall built for Tutmos III was later turned into a Christian church as is seen from the faces of the saints that can still be distinguished on the columns. Of the many rooms in the temple, one of the most interesting is known as the Botanical Garden because it is decorated with exotic plants and animals in testimony to the devotion displayed by pharaohs to their gardens and agriculture. And this is the great sacred lake where the priests of Amun-Ra used to purify themselves in the holy water that was channeled here from the Nile. This gigantic granite scarab, or beetle, was considered sacred by the Egyptians. It is said to be of good fortune if you walk around it. Going back north now on the Nile, we come to Cairo, capital of modern Egypt and a metropolis of almost 16 million inhabitants. Cairo was never a capital under the pharaohs. During their reign, there was only a small settlement here called Keriaha, which means place of battle, a name it earned because, according to legend, it was where the gods Horus and Seth fought. The only thing we know about the city's past is that around 500 BC it was called Babylonia and was an important commercial center. If you visit the Copt Quarter, one of the most ancient and picturesque parts of Cairo, you'll see that it is inhabited today by Orthodox Christians. It contains one of the most important temples in Christianity, the church that played host to the Holy Family and Jesus during their time in Egypt. During the Roman domination, Emperor Trajan had a fortress built here that was flanked by two huge round towers. 
the remains of the South Tower have been partially restored, while the North Tower was incorporated into the Church of St. George. Further up the Nile, where the river hits the sea, is Alexandria, the city founded by Alexander the Great in 332 BC. It is the last capital of ancient Egypt, and where Cleopatra, the last direct descendant of the pharaohs, lived and died. Today, with six million people, Alexandria is the second largest city in Egypt. Though it is an enchanting spot, like most modern cities, the chaotic traffic detracts somewhat from its appeal. In ancient times, it was the site of a great library, where thousands of scribes worked documenting the ancient Egyptian lifestyle for posterity. By and large, however, the splendor of the ancient city has been completely buried under the modern neighborhoods. There was a famous lighthouse, the Pharos at Alexandria, built here in 279 BC, that was subsequently damaged by earthquakes. In 1480, Sultan Quaitbai used most of its remains to construct this fortress, a masterpiece of military architecture. Some of the lighthouse's granite columns can still be seen in the gate of the main tower and in the surrounding walls that plunge into the sea. Today, it is difficult to imagine the lighthouse in all of its ancient splendor. But when it was built, it was almost 400 feet high and became one of the seven wonders of the world. The lighthouse was one of Cleopatra's favorites. This was her city, a city she loved more than the Roman generals she courted. With her suicide in 30 BC came the end of 3,000 years of rule by the pharaohs. Egypt lost her independence and became a province of the Roman Empire. As time went by, many of the cities of the pharaohs were abandoned and slowly fell into ruin. The simple houses built with mud bricks disappeared, and many of the monuments became open-air quarries, their stones used to make other buildings. Stones were even removed from the magnificent pyramids. The madrasa of Sultan Hassan in the city of Cairo was built with stones from the pyramids in 1362, it was a sort of university college, and its design is considered a masterpiece of Islamic architecture. The palace is perfectly proportioned, and its beauty owes a lot to the stones removed from the pyramids and used in its construction. This was a destiny that befell other monuments in the capital over the course of centuries, as magnificent works created by the pharaohs were dismantled. But still today in Egypt, the past and present come together as in no other country in the world. The writers, or scribes, from that time have left us with a treasure trove of literature that documents the amazing episodic adventures of pharaohs and queens, of great loves and tragic battles, and gods for every purpose. Their writings challenge the passing of the centuries and, in a way, proclaim the immortality that was sought by the pharaohs.